is Senator Charlita Tavares. And Senator Tavares has been a Columbus City Council person. She was on Columbus City Council. She has done lots of wonderful things. She runs an organization called MAC, Multi Advocate. Multi-Ethnic Advocates for Cultural Competency, and it's a great organization throughout the, the, that works throughout the entire state, and she also is our state senator. So we're very proud to have Senator Charlita Tavares here. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to stop talking and turn it back over to Christine, who organized all of this and has her questions to, to ask everybody. So thank you all for coming.
And yes, the, the, the world is great, absolutely wonderful. But I have one problem. There's a workshop, how come we don't have work? Can you work in more freedoms to work? Like, uh, there should be more openings in different areas. I believe I want to work in them. I love it if we have one. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Presented and uh, we did, you know, 
listen intently and go with me.
I was going to say, I think this is an area that maybe uh, if the legislators would like, we could provide them. I think what you're referring to is uh, something that's in the budget bill that was just uh, released uh, recently in the last day or so, as I think when, when folks saw that. And it, it relates to actually not having the legislators do things without our voice, but it does talk about Medicaid buy-in and eligibility for Medicaid, and it talks about um, how the Medicaid director might have more authority in determining uh, some of these things. So that, you know, we could maybe get a fact sheet. I think I saw something from the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Planning Council that just came out yesterday or maybe the day before. So our legislators may not know all about that quite yet, but we could get a fact sheet to them and share that information, and then they'd have time to really think through that, if that's, if that's okay. Yeah, um, that's just something that uh, was sent out and it really striked that we better not want to see individuals lose their Medicaid if they get a job. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Here. Yeah. So to that point, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here and hear that feedback directly from you. As you may know, the budget is the largest piece of legislation, 1,400 pages. It's very, it's very complicated. And so it's something we're all working on, particularly the members in the state house. The state senators haven't had a chance to see that. But seeing your hands, getting your feedback on those kind of provisions are important. So don't hesitate to continue to share your feedback, other information as you hear it, to let us know that concern is out there. Uh, the budget has a number of pieces that are going on. And, you know, uh, Medicaid expansion was so important. You had two questions uh, today, and, and we appreciate that. But really take the time to provide that feedback of what you're hearing and how it would impact you and your concerns. And this forum has been a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to see that and hear that directly. So thank you for giving us that opportunity and for making sure we hear that question. So also in some of the questions by the I do remember reading that people moving out of institutions, getting into the community on a waiver, their home for personal care rate will be higher than somebody who is not in an institution. That's one of the things proposed in the budget, I remember reading. Um, and there was also some issue regarding um, trying to have, for the first time, the Department of DD budget has not had a cut, if I remember correctly reading the details. Is that true, Zach? First time, not a real cut. It is accurate that, um, Christine, thank you. It is accurate that we are, uh, there, there are no cuts uh, that the department has Can experienced. Can I actually get you to speak in the mic? Thanks, Tanya. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Um, uh, I'm Zach Howout at the department. Um, it's good to see so many friendly faces out there. Um, Christine is accurate. Uh, the department experienced no uh, cuts in the inner, as introduced version of House Bill 59. So that makes uh, us all happy that this first time of no cuts. Um, Zach, um, sorry, <laughs> um, what is other important factors in the budget? Just a couple. Quick, is this in addition to my time slot, Christine? Or? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I don't have that much to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to answer your question, though. If that's how you want to proceed. Yes. This, this is your show, Christine. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, we'll, we'll wait till we get to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have another question here. Parking lots are not wheelchair accessible, need wider spaces for lift vans, cannot get out 
and have to pull over an unauthorized, or it's called an unmarked, spot. This is not unsafe. How many of you in there have said this over the past two months, or even if you haven't been to OSDA? How many of you think the parking is just not really focused on well? And the reason for that is we see in grocery stores that there are the parking spots and it says we can't catch parking, but it's made more for a car, not the van with the lift. It's like the if there's two parking spots, the one to the farthest needs to be not used in order for the lift van to come out. And we really all feel something needs to be put in legislation that parking areas in communities need to really think more about the parking to make sure while people get out of their wheelchairs, off their vans, that it's safe and they cannot just come in the parking and have the risk of a car coming and hitting. Who knows, but people were talking about that. Does anything... Does anyone have any questions or concerns on it? Uh, do you have it to be on the side? I think the um, handicap needs to be long too, because I know if we have things that the lift comes out in the back, and the handicap spots are not long enough for when you get the wheelchairs out, it's more or less if you're in a parking lot, the, if a car comes through the parking lot, the, the wheelchair can't get in because the um, uh, the cars are not looking for a wheelchair um, in the parking lot. They, they go past in the parking lot. But they, coming out in the road, you have to take up two spots in the parking lot because the, you come out right in the lane of traffic. So more or less, either you need to have the uh, handicap spot longer and wider or we're going to take out two spots because they will get hit. I'll let you get the one at five over the parking lot is like this, the handicap that come like this, that's doable. Because they're long enough and they're wide enough. So if it's like this, they're going to get hit. It's very unsafe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you.
I know it's not going to be the attempt to slip anything through. I'll make sure that we cast some light on to find out what's going on, and Jed and others are going to help me do that, um, because I wasn't aware of the issue, so it's important for us to, okay, to make sure that when this bill's passed, um, that we are keeping all of you in a good place going forward. So thank you for sharing. So, um, these were the questions. Does anyone else, if we have some time before my next uh, thing? Oh. Medicaid expansion, sorry. Um, so Medicaid expansion um, in the federal government, they are trying to change the income brackets for um, increasing the uh, poverty level for people to be on Medicaid. And um, the other thing is, regarding Medicaid that I really have seen and I really think it needs addressed. In the Medicaid age-blind disabled category, which a majority in here are under, well, the asset limit has been 1,500 ever since I was in God which was 1998. And with cost of living adjustments going up and all that, they increase the income, but they don't increase the asset. The federal limit is two thousand. We kept it at fifteen hundred, and I really think we need to enforce to change it to two thousand to meet federal regulations. But also, that would prevent another five hundred dollars worth of people getting to have money up to before saying you're too high for age blind disabled category. And because that goes along with the issue of well your income's too high for this and so then you you have to be under insurance. Something needs addressed in that and we all talked on that. Um what does anyone feel they like to say and we're open to professionals for their input too. Any point on that of increasing the asset limit from fifteen hundred to two thousand in the or doing Medicaid expansion. Yeah, my name is uh, Eve from uh, Art West. And uh, yeah, I think we uh, definitely need uh, more, uh, more money on, for the uh, expansion because Vesky are um, on the south side of Columbus, that's where I'm from. And south side of the uh, low pole of the whole entire slums. Uh, it's like south side, like, everybody looks at that side there. It's like west side needs money, north side needs side, but south side needs no money. And it's like we are building some up here, things still on the south side, but it's like they need more, more we need more money. You know, it's like they need uh, expansion to, to provide more, more places for people to get, uh, get the health care needs, especially if you're uh, disabled. Thank you. Thank you. 
you've got to make sure they can get in and out in an easy fashion. So I will continue to work on those issues. When the budget comes over to the Senate, uh, we will work with you to make sure that uh, we're staying on top of the issues that are most important to you. Thank you.
and follows up when there is a need for his intervention on an issue or a need for legislation to support individuals with a disability. He has introduced numerous bills, including a bill related towards traumatic brain injury. Representative Sinziong has been particularly supportive of the disability community in a number of areas. He has personally visited the early childhood school and adult programs of the Franklin County Board of Developmental Disabilities offering supports in any way. He has been supportive of Project STIR providing certificates of accommodation for graduates of Project STIR training and has set an excellent example for other counties and legislators with his support and offer to do more. He visited the Synergy Conference in 2012. He constantly meets with his constituents and attends disability awareness events at the State House or the with Franklin County Board of DD. Representative Michael Stinziano is an excellent legislator working collaboratively with other legislators of both parties to improve life for residents in his district in Ohio, especially individuals who have disabilities and who benefit from his voice at the State House. Steps towards independence and responsibility recognizes the fifth day April by Central Region of Ohio Self-Determination Association.
talking to you today. I'm going to go through a number of things, and then at the end, if you have any questions at all, I'd be happy to address those questions. Uh, I wanted to talk. I wanted to talk first uh, about employment first. Uh, that was mentioned uh, by Christine, and I know that there was there were probably some more questions out there. About a year ago, um, the governor signed an executive order uh, in permitting uh, employment first. Uh, in, uh, in Ohio, and uh, it's something that uh, we are, we've been very supportive of uh, at, at the department and uh, have encouraged the governor and worked with the governor to kind of implement that policy. Um, we are doing a number of things in the budget to, uh, to kind of increase employment first to ensure that uh, the governor's executive <coughs> order uh, is enacted a little more fully. And I'm just going to briefly mention those things, and then if there are questions, I can stop and answer. Uh, those questions are happy to kind of go on and, and talk about uh, the remaining of what I have to say. Um, again, uh, employment first is a, is a big deal at our department. We are uh, working every day to try to implement uh, this notion that the individuals that we serve uh, have, a, have a, you know, almost a right, and uh, we want to encourage them those that want to work in the community to be able to do that. Uh, to that end, uh, we have uh, four or five things that uh, in, in the budget that uh, apply directly to, to the employment first policy. The first is, is really data. Um, it's data driven. We, uh, we don't have a good handle currently uh, at, the, at the state level among agencies as to what various terms actually mean. Some people uh, have mental health might say uh, community employment would mean one thing, and folks at the Department of Developmental Disabilities uh, say community employment it really means something else. So what we have done in this budget is to try to find, uh, try to draft some uniform definitions for things like community employment that will apply to all departments. That way, um, data should come back and we're really all talking about the same thing when we, uh, when we talk about in community employment, integrated employment, or uh, well, I guess those are two big ones. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a presumption uh, in the department, in, in this budget, a uh, presumption that all folks uh, with developmental disabilities are presumed to be able to work in the community. Uh, that's something that we feel strongly about. Uh, currently, right now, we, uh, we know that a lot of folks are presumed to be able to work in the community and, and at times are uh, possibly kind of directed uh, to workshops when they may want to actually work in the community. So uh, we're uh, asking that as folks kind of go through their ISP process that they really take a strong look at um, community employment first uh, before um, it's assumed that someone necessarily wants to kind of work in, in a workshop. Um, county boards, we're asking county boards to also implement their own employment first policies, set benchmarks, look at things that they can do better, and then get back to the department um, with kind of what they think um, uh, needs to happen in order to kind of implement a uh, community driven employment first policy. In addition to that, there's the money. Uh, we have uh, $1 million, it's a new line item, an employment first line item in each uh, fiscal year that will be um, used to implement the Employment First policies. Uh, we're very excited about this. This is new money that um, we received. So to, if somebody asked me if there was a cut in the budget, actually there is not. This is uh, new money. There's, there's uh, new money in, in our budget to kind of implement these things. And we're very excited that uh, we've had OEM and government support uh, for, uh, for that. Um, that's what I wanted to say about employment first, and I'm happy to stop there and take questions if folks have questions uh, before I go on. Right there, in front. I get into one question. What happened? What happened is that person tried to get the place of business, asking for a job, and then Part of the placement, why did the job the services tell that person that uh, you can't come in and apply for a job? Then why? 
So, so I understand your question. Um, what happens if someone comes in and applies for a job? Yeah, in a, in a wheelchair. Yeah. And then, and then, and then the employer says no because they have because they have a wheelchair. That's right. But they don't give them an application. They don't give them an application. Okay, so they, they don't allow them to apply because that individual has a wheelchair. Or disability also. Or a disability. Or a disability. Yeah.
set up like that, you know, put a workshop, we need to get more suitability, we need to get more, get more, get more, get more stuff, get more, get more people in our workshop, we need to get more clients, and more, and more attention. Thank you, Christine Brown. Please take us back and uh, put them on tables in your offices. 